this is Pat Solver with the Dr. Ways In, and I'm at MedEx in on the Stanford campus. And I have an old buddy, I think one of my <laughs> oldest digital health buddies, Steve Chan. Dr. Stephen Chan. Well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> and um, we're going to talk about digital mental health. So, Steve, why don't we start out by having you just say a little bit about yourself and what you're up to? Sure. I'm uh, actually a senior resident over at Univers the University of California Davis School of Medicine and Psychiatry. And I'm also um, serving on the Council of Communications at the American Psychiatric Association and an associate editor for iMedical Apps, a blog that's written by physicians for physicians uh, reviewing apps. And who else do you write for? I also write for you too, the <laughs> Dr. Ways In, the Dr. Ways In, yes. So yes, my articles there on the mental health. So I'm not going to dwell on this, but I think I've said to you a million times, Steve, I don't know how you do all of this stuff when you're still a resident because, geez, all I did when I was a resident was just keep my head above the water. Oh, my goodness. No, I'm still I'm still trying to do that. If you saw my calendar, it'd be, and you might have seen it before. I think I, um, it's like back to back, just time blocks of things to do. So it's a lot of fun. So I'll get that article into you. Okay. <laughs> so... Um, we're going to switch gears so we can talk about digital mental health because um, when I first started uh, telling stories around the digital health world, I, I used to say to people, how come there's nothing going on in mental health? There, were, there was nothing going on in mental health in the initial years. And now, and you're really at the forefront of this, um, so many interesting things are happening. And you had a very interesting, diverse panel, uh, except there were no women. But um, yes. this is my fault. This is my fault. <laughs> Leaving that yeah. aside, um, I wondered if you could just take us through um, some of the key areas um, and technologies that are being used uh, now to help make mental health more accessible, more affordable, and hopefully more effective. Well, you know, we always think about um, when it comes to figuring out illnesses and diseases, you do an assess, you do, you get a patient interview, or you, you know, speak with them, you gather data, um, objective data, subjective data, and then you also make an assessment and you make a plan, just like a, you know, soap note, right, in, in the doctor parlance. So, the part where you actually gather data, that's the communications part. That's where you may be using a telepsychiatry, telemedicine platform, telehealth, telepsychiatry, all these different words. Where we're using video. Um, and that, there's a lot of startups around this area and a lot of research that shows that it's as effective as in-person care. Um, there's also communication. And wait, I, I'm going to stop and drill into that a bit because there's some people who would listen to this and say, really? I I don't have to be face to face with my mental health provider. Is that going to be as effective? Well, actually, a lot of uh, research done by Peter Yellowlees, who was on our panel, and Don Hilty, some of the leading telepsychiatry, telemental health researchers, have found that you don't really have to be there in person. Um, a lot of laws and rules say that you should see them first in person, but in actually, actually, for those who have um, phobias or anxiety uh, and are not, don't want to come out of the house or isolated, this is actually much more helpful to them. Yeah. And uh, Okay, so there's, so there's telemedicine, I'm assuming, with all its different platforms. What about our ubiquitous handheld computer known as the smartphone? What's going yeah. on there? So there's a lot of sensors, as you know. There's a lot of startups that are doing things to gather as much what we call passive data from the gyroscope, the light sensors, the camera, um, what apps you're using, and even maybe uh, there's some research on what maybe what you're texting can reveal clues to your emotions. Um, so there are some products out there that will try to gather the data and ascertain what your mood is too but it's still in its infancy it's not been fully clinically validated um, but there's a review paper out in 2014 that lists some of those projects in the research and the commercial worlds too so it, it raises another issue for me because a lot of the things that I see in digital health are treating what I call grandma medicine. Mm -hmm. Those are the kinds of things your grandmother used to take care of. You didn't used to go to the doctor for them. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and in mental health, um, and in particular, you know, as I look at healthcare costs, it's not being driven so much by the people who've got anxiety and, you know, feeling a little bit low, but it's being driven by the major mental health issues, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, um, um, severe depression. Um, what's going on in digital mental health to treat those, um, you know, more profound disorders? Well, you know, I would actually argue that, um, you know, schizophrenia, yes, it's a very severe cognitive 
debilitating mental disorder. Two million people in the country face this. Actually, I think the statistic is a little under 1% of the population in the U.S. face this. Um, and they may take up a lot of um, costs because of hospitalizations and, and the lack of insight. They don't realize that they have a disorder. But there's on the opposite end, depression and anxiety, those are much bigger uh, more prevalent issues. Uh, about 30 million people have anxiety issues, and that can actually make their physical health worse, make them not as uh, not as likely to take care of control of their diabetes or their obesity problems. So I think that there's uh, you know a lot of opportunity for handling both sides of um, the mental, all the spectrum of severity of mental illnesses. Well, we heard today that there's a lot of work being done at the VA, and I had actually heard of this before we had this excellent presentation today on the management of PTSD. And I'm not going to dwell on that, um, but what I wanted to ask you is, we know that besides just our veterans who are suffering from PTSD, that there are people here in, in, you know, that got their um, trauma here within the context of the family. What's being done in the area of digital mental health for victims of, of uh, family violence, child abuse, and, and so forth in the mental health sequelae? Is there anything going on? You know, I have not seen anything in the literature for that. I know that telepsychiatry has been, telepsychiatry, uh, in terms of video, has been used for child cases where they did find out that um, molestation has occurred because the patient or the child was more honest and forthcoming to the doctor who is either male or female who's on the television. They call it the TV, the TV doctor. And so they, in that respect, in academic case reports, they, there's, there are case reports in, about that. But I have not seen any for dom victims of domestic violence, sexual abuse, or molestation, and that's something I think that needs to be addressed more because I think the statistic is I think one in is it one in four women face uh, some sort of violence directed against them in this country. It's it's very prevalent. And yeah, it's I, very I prevalent, guess. and we know that if if you've been um, exposed to violence as a child, that you can have lifelong if effects not just on your mental health but on your physical health as well. But um, you know, I want to close by saying and have let you have closing comments on this. So we've seen all this exciting stuff today, yeah. and um, and whenever I read about what you're doing and the colleagues that you've introduced me to, I see all this incredible stuff. But we still have such a long ways to go um, in terms of you know even the, this area of, of of abuse. How do how do you see what are the big needs in order to take the progress that's been made so far and have it go much faster and reach more people? Okay, so I I think actually it's a bigger it's kind of like what digital health in the physical for physical illnesses is facing now. You can create an app that will detect PTSD or depression and track things, but by itself it's isolated and doesn't address the entire system or the continuum of care. Um, physical health, I know, has they've been realizing this and this is why insurance companies are on board and uh, health systems are on board of creating their own apps. But I have yet to see any that's uh, really... Um, taken hold for emotional mental health. Um, I mean, we had some speakers here at Stanford that talk about, you know, your hospital, is hospital stay or your cancer care. But what about mental health? What about your feelings and your emotions and the stress that you're going through, especially if you're post-surgical and you're maybe a little delirious or, or you might have those issues? Um, I think it's a more system-wide thing. And I think that for, you know, folks who have broader uh, big picture thinking, they, they're they the ones who need to link everything together and bring everybody under the same roof. All right. So you heard it here. Steve's predicted that we may eventually put the mind back in the body. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much, Steve. It was really fun having this and conversation. When are we going to do a hackathon again? <laughs> Soon. <One more. laughs> Soon. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you for having me, Pat. Okay. My pleasure.